Well, welcome again to Greenfield in the Diaspora as we make our way through this admittedly unusual Holy Week. Tonight we come to the upper room and the last night that Jesus sat with his disciples. Maundy, from the Latin word commandment. This is the night that Jesus gave us words that are so relevant to us today. As I have loved you, you also ought to love one another. Welcome to worship. Loaves were broken, words were spoken by the Galilean shore. Jesus' bread of life from heaven was their food forevermore. By your body. Our scripture lessons this evening follow Jesus' best friend, Simon Peter. The first reading comes from the middle of Mark's gospel, the eighth chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. Jesus and the disciples find themselves at Caesarea Philippi. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know what it felt like? Um, it felt like dad strength. You know, when you were a kid and you're wrestling with your dad, you know, and he's just taking all the hits and he's toying with you, and then boom, he just takes you down. Jesus set in me straight that day. I felt a lot like that. Okay, okay, I know, I know. Hindsight is 2020, but at that time and at that moment, I, I just couldn't figure out what he was talking about, you know? I mean, why did he have to suffer? Why did he have to die? No, 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 not, not on my watch. This wasn't gonna happen, no sir. It just wasn't like he was he was thinking straight, you know? I kept thinking maybe he's dehydrated, maybe he's hungry. The man never got enough to eat, if you ask me. So I take him aside and I start get laying into him. And before I could even get very far, he stops me, looks me in the eyes, because he has those eyes. And you know what he said to me? Get behind me, Satan. Dad's strength. 
Those words, those eyes, that moment floored me. He floored me. But I mean, seriously, get behind me, Satan. All right, I admit I have some flaws, you know, but Satan, I mean, that stung a bit, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I just didn't get it. I just didn't see the whole picture, which won't be the last time that'll happen, mind you. <laughs> you see, I, I wanted him to use that, that dad strength on the world, you know? I mean, my desires, my plans. And your boy, Peter's plans, they don't always work out so good i.e. ear slicing, etc. But he knew, he knew all along, <laughs> he would give us just enough rope for allow us to figure things out for ourselves. And then he just, he had that dad strength, you know? He pulls us back in. Right at that moment, we needed saving from ourselves. That was his plan all along, saving us from ourselves. Saving me from myself. Our second lesson this evening comes from John's Gospel, the 13th chapter. Jesus and the disciples find themselves in the upper room. Listen for the word of God. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever noticed how sometimes religious people do things that seem so, well, religious, and yet when you pull the skin back, they don't look as pure and holy as they initially seem? For example, prayer. You know as well as I do that prayer can sometimes be used as a club, as a curse, and not just as a cry to God. One summer, a friend of mine, Tom, was leading a Bible study, and they came to one of those passages in the New Testament that describes the Christian life as an experience of suffering. And they discussed that for a while, and Tom went on to make a few comments 
Um, and in those comments, he tried to contrast this notion of the church suffering for the world with some of the things that you see on religious television these days, where there are so many slim, attractive, square-jawed, dimple-cheeked, rich and successful people on the screen, millionaires for the Messiah, linebackers for the Lord, beauty queens for Christ, he said. Well, Tom said later, maybe I shouldn't have put it just that way. Because sure enough, as soon as the Bible study ended, he was accosted by a woman who had been part of the study. Um, she was sputtering with rage, so much so that he couldn't really tell what was wrong initially. But eventually she got to the point. She was offended because he had made fun of beauty queens. Apparently in her younger days, she had been the runner up for the Miss Alabama beauty pageant. It was one of the most important times of her life. Furthermore, she went on to say beauty was a gift from God and he was being irreverent. Well, Tom apologized profusely, said that he really didn't have anything against beauty queens. Some of my best friends are, no, he didn't really say that. Um, but he did go on to say he just didn't think it was a good model of suffering Christianity. Well, that didn't satisfy her. In fact, she immediately turned on her heels and began to stalk away. But as she did, she turned back puckered her lips the way the cherubim sometimes look in those religious art pieces, and she said, I'll pray for you. Now, I'll pray for you uh, can be some of the loveliest words that one person says to another. But in this case, Tom said, I did not feel loved. <laughs> what she said was, I'll pray for you. What she meant was, and I hope that God cleans your clock, and the sooner the better. Obviously not Miss Congeniality. The words seem so holy, I'll pray for you, but sometimes we do things that look religious, but when you peel back the skin a little, they're not quite so pure. And I'm not really pointing the finger at her. I know I am as hypocritical as she was. We have all done this. We have all learned how to use religious language as a mask of sorts, a mask for our rage or our greed or our gossipy curiosity. I am told that down south, uh, if you use the words, well, bless her heart, you can go on to say just about anything about a person. However, sometimes, and more tragically, the difference between the appearance and the reality of a religious deed is not due to hypocrisy. Sometimes we do our best to serve others in the name of Jesus, but we still wind up doing damage. We do everything we can to love another, and we wind up hurting them. One of the theologians at my seminary used to talk about what he called the ironic consequences of human action. What I think he meant by that is that human sin is not just the malicious deeds that we intend to do. Sin is always deeper than our intentions. It is also the things that we do even in our best moments and with the best of intentions. A number of years ago, a friend of mine and I were in New York City. We were sitting in a coffee house uh, waiting for the bus that was going to take us uptown. As we were sitting there drinking our coffee, I happened to notice over in the corner uh, at another table a street person. He obviously did not fit in with the crowd in the coffee house. It was a cold night, and he was obviously not well enough dressed. 
he was cradling in his hands a styrofoam cup of coffee, which I assumed he had bought with the last few cents in his pocket. He was putting some sugar in the coffee. First one packet, then another, then another, and another, and another, until finally, I assume, the coffee was like syrup, and it was clear that coffee was going to be his meal that night, and the sugar, his energy against the chill of the night. Well, as I saw this, I, as I was watching him, I happened to reach into my coat pocket, and there were a couple of dollars, probably left over from some interaction earlier that day. I thought to myself, he needs this more than I do. And so, quite unobtrusively, I got up from my table, and I went over and I just put those dollar bills on the corner of his table. I returned to my seat. Now, I did this uh, not because I am so good-hearted or I'm a soft touch, but I have come to believe that as followers of Jesus, we are not to pass by need without showing some compassion. However, I was stunned. As soon as I got back to my table, he had followed me. He scoured uh, a look at me and then slammed the money down on the table. His pride, obviously, offended. I had tried to show Christian love, but in the process had done one of the things that faith condemns. I had deprived him of some of his dignity. Sometimes even when we try to love, we wind up doing harm. Now, you may say that what we need to learn from all this is what we might call a little gospel common sense, and you would be right. We need to be humble enough to admit that even with our best intentions and our purest motives, they are often mixed. And therefore, we always have the potential to do harm even when we intend to do good. So we have to be free in the Christian faith to repent not only of our malicious sins, but even of our best intentions to pick it back up tomorrow and try to do it again in a better way. And you would be absolutely right. Good Christian common sense. But there is a deeper and perhaps even more difficult lesson that many of us have to learn as well. And it is one that is taught to us, I think, most poignantly in our lesson from John's Gospel this evening, the story of this night, the story of the occasion when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Now, some people like to move right to the bottom line of that story. They like to get right to the point, which is, of course, if you, if I, your Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, and by implication, the world's feet. Which means that as Christian disciples, we are, every one of us, called to acts of lowly service to each other and to the world. But if we move too quickly to that point, we may well miss another point that most of us need to learn. Notice none of the disciples were ready to wash anyone else's feet until theirs had been washed by Jesus. In other words, no disciple is prepared to minister to human need until she has admitted and received from her own need from Jesus. No disciple is prepared to wash the mud from another person's need until he has realized that the water of grace is still damp on his own feet. Because Christian service is never just civilized charity. It is always the gratitude that overflows from those who know that the only thing that they have to give is what they have received. 
And so Christian service is never reaching down. It is always reaching across. And the basin that we offer is one in which our own feet have sat. Can we allow him to wash our feet? There is a scene in the play, the subject was roses. In the scene, a young man, Timmy, is having a painful conversation with his father. Actually, it's not much of a conversation. The father is doing all of the talking. Now, the father loves his son, and he's trying to express that love to him, but he's doing it in all the wrong ways. He's thumping his own chest about what a good provider he has been. He's trying to manipulate the boy into doing what he thinks is right. He is, if you know what I mean, loving down to him. He's doing all the talking and none of the listening. He's doing all of the giving of advice and wisdom and none of the receiving. Finally, the son, under this barrage of words, appeals, Pop, listen to me. But the words continue. Until the son, again, with a firmer and louder voice, says, Pop, listen to me. And something in his voice silences the father. Pop, I used to have a dream about you and me. It was always the same. I would dream that someone told me you had died. And I ran out into the street crying. And someone would stop me and say, why are you crying? And I would say, my father's dead. And he never told me that he loved me. The father stiffens at those words and tries to interrupt, but the son continues, Pop, listen. I had that dream again last night. I thought about it all day today. But I learned something that I had never seen before. It's true. You've never said that you loved me. But it's also true. I've never said those words to you. I don't know what you mean, Pop. I say them to you now. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I love you. The father's body becomes brittle. But then the words from his son surround him, almost absorb him, until he opens his arms and, done, and does what he has never been able to do before. He embraces his son in love. Jesus loved his own. He loved them to the very end. I don't know what you're talking about. He says to you, I love you. I, I don't know what you mean. He wraps a towel around himself and comes to you with a basin. I, I don't know what you're talking about. If you do not receive this, you have no part of me. But as I wash your feet, you are empowered to wash each other's feet. O oh Lord, not just my feet, but all of me. Amen.
come together now in a time of prayer. Gracious God, we come to you this evening as those who strive to follow Jesus in all of our living and to trust your power even in our dying. We gather this night to reflect upon the life that ended on a cross. We recognize in ourselves the strengths and the weaknesses of Jesus' disciples. Although they loved him, they so often disappointed and failed him. And yet, gathering with those imperfect friends for a last meal, Jesus washed their feet in service and then extended the bread and the wine to each of them. He called them friends, called them to love one another, and entrusted to them this amazing ministry of love. And tonight we are humbled by the invitation to sit at that same table, and we too take seriously the calling to be his body on this earth today. Forgive us when we disappoint you, when we fail you, and guide us back to a place of trust and faithfulness. Grant us the vision to see this world as you see it, with love and compassion for each person, for every creature, and for all of your creation. We ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Tonight, as we sit secluded in our homes, we remember that Jesus also knew what it was like to be alone, cut off from friends and family. And so tonight, let me leave you with some inspiring words from the 16th chapter of John's Gospel, where Jesus says, The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you may have persecution, but be of good courage. I have overcome the world. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Amen.